an issue that uh, would be of interest to all of you. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, this one is. It's about renewable energy. I'm going to focus on uh, commercial wind energy and industrial solar and look at the unintended consequences of our activities, recognizing that in ecology, if you remember, there's no such thing as a free lunch. There are things that, that happen no matter what we do. And so um, we're going to focus on um, some of these issues and why are we pushing renewables and uh, questions like that. So anyway, I'm sure everybody here recognizes the issues with global climate change, our greatest environmental challenge, current and very likely into the future. <clears throat> it, it affects our health, our security. Um, all the plants and animals are affected one way or another. Uh, habitats are affected. And uh, um, it's a global impact. Um, so clearly an issue that we, we have to address. And sadly, our inability to make significant and meaningful progress here, Congress can't even pass a cap and trade bill, as I think we're probably all aware, um, has some rather frightening ramifications and certainly uh, grave consequences if we don't reverse trends very quickly. So um, one of the things we want to look at is, okay, how do we deal with our carbon footprint, whether that's dealing with carbon dioxide or methane or ozone or sulfur? oxides or nitrous oxides or chlorofluorocarbons or uh, uh, there's a chemical I didn't even mention um, that is used in, in industrial wind turbines, uh, sulfur hexafluoride. It's uh, something like a thousand times as potent a greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide, even much more so than, than methane. So even uh, with, uh, with renewables, there, there are some consequences. So we're going to look at uh, some of these issues and, and some of the challenges and how to try to deal with them. I think we as a society tend to, to look at issues and try to think about solutions. How do we address our carbon footprint? How do we address climate change? Um, and so that, of course, means how do we replace burning things with, with renewable alternatives? Makes sense. Yeah, it, it certainly does. And the problem, however, and what I'm going to focus on this evening, uh, uh, probably very briefly, is, is we don't want to create in our effort to address our carbon footprint, new and additional problems that affect species and habitats. Just not the direction we want to go. And I'm going to focus again on commercial wind and industrial solar as examples. Um, this, is, this is troubling, and it's just the way things happen. I think we all agree that, that making money, whether you're a shareholder, corporate executive, or whatever, that's, that's a passion we probably all have, particularly if you're invested in uh, different uh, stocks and bonds and whatever. Uh, and wind and solar are clearly no exception to this rule. However, the development of renewables should not be at the expense of sound science. It should be based on adequate monitoring, assessment, review uh, of the impacts that either we project are going to take place or we document are taking place and, uh, and deal with these. And unfortunately, currently, um, these kind of things, sound science is not the driver uh, for what's going on, which is, is, is troubling. In our zeal to burn fossil fuels, ultimately, of course, as you're all aware, releasing greenhouse gases and suffering the effects from, from these consequences, I call it the drill, spill, and chill mentality of, of recent past. We'll leave it at that. Um, this current administration has, in many respects, made about a 180-degree turn. And so rather than dealing with oil and gas, now they're focusing on renewables. And that, uh, that could be a good thing if it were done properly, particularly in regard to wind and solar. But there are some, some problems that, that are happening. In theory, um, this might be a good thing if, if we were addressing, using sound science to address issues, but we're not adequately evaluating, let alone systematically addressing the consequences of renewable energy development, particularly in regard to migratory birds, insectivorous bats, and their habitats and um, uh, the both suites of species that are affected by, by these activities. So that's what I'm going to sort of focus on tonight and, and uh, see what we can, what are the problems and how do we address them. This is having very troubling and unintended consequences. And in my opinion, if we don't immediately address uh, some of these issues, then we're going to see species which are already in decline now, affected we could eliminate them or conceivably um, uh, through additive mortality 
they could go extinct. And as Edward O. Wilson has said, extinction is forever. So I think you've heard me say in class, God knows how many times for those courses that uh, you've taken with me. So we want to we want to try to avoid that. That's that's the the issue. And I want to be clear here that industrial wind energy and industrial solar development alone are not in and of themselves causing these population declines. It's it's a number of things. With some exceptions, there are some individual facilities that are killing inordinate numbers of bats. And uh, we're seeing some species are really in steep decline and they're being heavily, bird species in particular, heavily impacted by, by um, uh, the, the power tower solar facility, Ivanpah in California, which we'll talk about shortly. But generally speaking, it's a, it's a combination of things. Um, so the concern here, we, if you remember back in class, we talked about additive mortality. The concern here is that the impact of wind on, on these organisms may be additive to normal, what we call compensatory mortality. And um, when that occurs, then that can affect populations, cause them to, to go into decline. And that's what we clearly want to try to avoid. The footprints of both industrial wind energy uh, and solar energy are enormous. There's a project that Fish and Wildlife Service is um, probably going to give final approval in South Central Wyoming of over a thousand turbines. These are turbines 550, 600 feet in height uh, in this area. And um, that, that kind of scares me because we have a migratory corridor for the whooping crane, uh, which may get into this area and a whole host of other species that could be impacted. And uh, we're seeing, particularly in the Mojave Desert in California, uh, especially on Bureau of Land Management lands, uh, some of these enormous <coughs> solar power tower generators. Ivanpah is the one that's up and operating. It's not fully operational yet. The temperatures at the heater beater, the, this, these 300,000 mirrors concentrate light into this tower. Right now they're reaching about 800 degrees Fahrenheit. So when something flies through it, it literally gets incinerated. And we're seeing birds dying, um, some cases as, as many as one every couple of minutes, which is uh, very, very frustrating. And these, these facilities are, of course, taking up huge acreages of habitat, which means something's losing its home. So um, in addition to loss of habitat, the fragmentation disturbance issues, um, there, of course, are the direct mortality issues, which I'll talk about here very shortly. So. Let's talk about migratory birds. Why, why are migratory birds important? Uh, what's, what's the deal? Well, there are currently 1,027 species of migratory birds that are protected. Um, in my former position with Fish and Wildlife Service, that was one of the things I, I worked on was the, I was the national lead on, on uh, avian structural issues, any structures that affected birds. Uh, I was the lead on it and fishing gear impacts. Uh, these birds are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918 as amended. And uh, um, anyway, this, this treaty is, is powerful and important because it implements four bilateral conventions with, with uh, Canada, Mexico, Japan, and Russia. It's called a strict liability statute, which simply means that um, either our law enforcement agents or Department of Justice does not have to show intent uh, criminal intent in, in committing a taking, uh, injury or death of a, of a migratory bird. So authorities don't have to show that. So it, it creates a rather interesting legal challenge uh, as far as uh, dealing with, with industries and, uh, and the public in, in general. Birds are critically important. They provide key ecosystem services which fuel multi-billion dollar pollination, insect and weed seed control efforts, both for agribusiness and for the forest products industries. So if we didn't have migratory birds, just think of all the additional pesticides, herbicides, and chemicals we'd have to use. And frankly, we don't want to go there. If you read Rachel Carson's Silent Spring way back in the 1960s, you get it. I mean, this is a, this is a huge issue. And of course, we've continued those discussions and refined the, uh, the issues uh, um, as we've um, you know, learned more about pesticide and, and chemical use. So we want to try to avoid that if we can. Interestingly, feeding, photographing, and watching migratory birds fuels about a 28 billion, with a B, recreational industry in the U.S. I'm told that more people feed, photograph, and watch birds than play golf. So Tiger Woods may be a little bit unhappy about that, but, but bird watching is, is an even greater passion for um, 
Americans, one in four people in America, I'm told, uh, one in four adults is, uh, is a bird watcher involved one way or another. I know my wife and I, uh, we spend, what, um, 100 bucks a week or so on 50-pound bags of, of whole black oil sunflower seed for, the, for our bird feeders. So, um, yeah, we, we get it. At any rate, um, number of migratory bird species, notably bald and golden eagles, common ravens, American crows, sandhill and whooping cranes, several species of hawks, falcons, doves, owls, hummingbirds, among others, are revered by some of our Native American tribes, as well as Canadian First Nation peoples. So do they not also have a right um, to have their species that are of importance to them um, religiously or otherwise protected as well? I would say yes, I think they do. And of course, we federal agencies have an obligation under, under uh, not only NEPA and the uh, um, uh, Native Religious Freedoms Act to deal with them uh, in, an, in an adequate way, and sometimes we're not. Some of these uh, very species are at considerable risk from habitat disturbance, habitat fragmentation, injury and death from turbine blade collisions, and either being overheated, cooked by these, these power tower solar arrays, or um, mistaking the, uh, um, the, uh, the uh, solar um, generators as water and colliding with them, suffering blunt force trauma and so on, and share some statistics here very shortly on that. So um, there are these unintended consequences which we have to deal with. Insectivorous bats. Okay, probably I would suspect the majority of you in here are not big bat aficionados and um, you may have some very negative feelings about bats, and, and I would agree that they're some of the most malign animals in the world, uh, but they play critical roles and provide key ecosystem services to humanity, and, and sadly, they're hugely misunderstood by the public. Bats save literally billions of dollars in the U.S. alone by protecting forest products and agricultural business industry uh, uh, Entities each year, it's is estimated from four to fifty billion dollars. It averages about thirty billion or uh, twenty-three billion dollars per year just in the services they provide uh, in consuming insects. Big brown bat um, used to be common around here. Now bats are uh, in steep decline. One big brown bat can consume from three thousand to seven thousand mosquitoes per night. Um, and just think of these, uh, Chris uh, is very interested and in, has worked in, in the, the, the medical profession as a nurse. Uh, you, you get it. Uh, these bats, some of them may be carrying West Nile virus, um, malaria, chikungunya virus, and other diseases as well that, that affect us. So just the benefits alone of, of um, protecting these species, consuming insects. A colony of about 20 million Mexican free-tailed bats you've ever been down to the Austin Bridge in Texas, um, good place to see a boatload of Mexican free-tailed bats. But at any rate, these bats will consume about a quarter of a million pounds of insects per, mite, per night. A quarter of a million pounds. That's, that's a lot of insects. Uh, so they're providing huge benefits. So if they're lost to either uh, collisions with turbines or solar facilities, then that's a loss of a benefit to humanity and um, I, uh, probably to the planet. They consume things like June beetles, leaf hoppers, spotted cucumber beetles, green stink bugs. And I notice the stink bugs are coming out now here in the Washington area. Corn earworm larvae, gypsy moths. We've all heard about the gypsy moth plagues, spruce budworms, and many, many other insects. So they are critically important. And uh, um, while we may not like bats, um, say some of us don't, uh, they, they are critically important in providing things. Uh, of the 45 species of bats that are found in the lower 48, the contiguous 48 states, sadly six of them are federally endangered on the endangered species list. These include the gray bat, the Indiana bat, Ozark big-eared, Virginia big-eared, lesser long-nosed, and the Mexican long-nosed bats. Uh, the little brown bat has been petitioned for emergency listing by my former agency, Fish and Wildlife Service as an endangered species. Now, I don't know, I haven't followed up on the current status of that listing petition, but um, my wife and I used to commonly see lots of bats, and we have a bat house up our place in Maine, and we did not count what, one this summer, not one when we were up there. So it's very, very troubling. And down here in Virginia, we're seeing the same situation, just not 
many bats out there. Um, add to this, uh, particularly for cave dwelling bats, the the um, especially the genus Myotis, this would be the little brown bat and the Indiana bat amongst others, um, the fungal disease known as white nose syndrome. This is caused by Pseudogymnoascus destructans, appropriately named, which has been estimated to have killed over 7 million bats to date. Um, these bats get this, as you can see this, this uh, um, either Indiana or little brown down here in the bottom, it gets this fungal mass, particularly on its nose, and what happens is when it's, when it's hibernating, uh, the fungus um, activates its system, it wakes up, it starts burning body fat, and then it either starves or will actually go out and start flying, and of course, not a good thing, and it and ends up uh, freezing to death and dying. So, um, they, uh, uh, Paul Cryan, a colleague that, that I've worked with very closely and know, really good man, he's the leading expert for, for um, bat work um, for USGS. They're racing to try to figure out, they know what the fungus is, but they don't know the etiology of how it actually works and how do you, how do you treat it. A uh, little bit of promising news. Some of the bat colonies actually appear to be resistant to the disease. So um, they're, my former agency is working hard to try to protect them. But we're seeing the consequences of, particularly in the Northeast, more than 80% population decline of, of bats uh, have been noted to date. So very, very uh, troubling issue. Um, the impact of bats again, um, Sean Smallwood, colleague and friend from uh, UC Davis, um, um, and uh, author of a number of publications that I've worked with on a lot of issues, including when Sean uh, published a projection based on 2012 uh, analyses. He estimated that at least 888,000 bats per year are being killed just in collisions um, with, uh, with wind energy facilities. And this was based on 51,600 some megawatts, what we call installed capacity. And your eyes probably glaze over, what the devil does that mean? Basically, that's the operating capacity of wind turbines that are installed. Figure the average turbine is about two and a half to three megawatts, some clearly larger. And so um, we could figure that would be based about on about 30,000 operating turbines in 2012. Well, right now we've just increased the capacity by another 10,000. It's 61,300 and some change megawatts installed capacity based on the American Wind Energy Association's latest uh, statistics. So wind is growing explosively and uh, there are things that, that are that are troubling about the effects. Um, Paul and his team, Paul Cryan and his team, believe that, that bats are being lost at unprecedented numbers uh, from collisions with, with wind turbines and from what we call barotrauma. So barotrauma, these, these blades are enormous, as you'll see in a minute. Uh, they create uh, blade tip vortices and they create huge levels of turbulence. So the sudden change in air pressure, a small mammal like that, you get a sudden uh, variance in air pressure and the lungs collapse. And so bear trauma is, uh, is, can be a lethal, lethal effect um, um, that, uh, that they're suffering. And the tree roosting bats seem to be the most susceptible. That includes the hoary, silver-haired, and eastern red bats that we have around here in the east. Why they remain susceptible to these turbine blade collisions is yet unknown. We have a lot of theories all has got a whole laundry list of things. Um, these tree bats have evolved behaviors. Some of them are what we call lek breeding. The males congregate around tall trees. Well, we're seeing males congregating around uh, these wind turbine blades as well. And um, is that the issue? Um, don't know. There are a whole host of hypotheses, and they're still trying to tease out what's, what's going on. But it certainly does appear that their behaviors that have evolved naturally around trees are maladaptive to, to surviving around, around wind turbines, based on uh, a number of experts, Paul Cryan, Ed Arnett, and, and clearly others. Um, we, could, we could also suggest that, that um, this level of mortality to bats is creating additive mortality. So I would, I would suggest and call this time for, time for some action, folks. Call to action here. So... What do we do? Well, we know that insectivorous bats tend to forage on insects when the air is pretty, pretty calm, um, sort of like tonight, um, hardly a breeze at all, maybe uh, half a meter of airspeed per second blowing up to about three meters. So the insects are out there. The bats are going to be out foraging because that's when they're going to be feeding is when there's a, a food source available. Um, but the problem is 
um, and you can see we uh, worked by Tom Kuntz and his team here. Uh, thermal imagery um, um, is quite amazing. We can actually key in on individual bats as they've done here and, and see how they fly and how, they, how their behavior relates to turbines. Um, these, uh, these animals um, get hit by, even though th those blades are not moving very fast, again, when you've got a blade that's over, greater than the width of a football field, um, that's pretty sizable. And the tips of the, of the blades can still be moving fast enough that blunt force trauma or whatever uh, can do them in. So one of the suggestions and one of the things that, that has been very promising that my friend and colleague Ed Arnett um, and his team have been working on up at Castleman in Pennsylvania, wind facility I visited a couple years ago, is increasing the cut-in speed of turbine blades. So cut-in is the actual wind speed that the, the blade is actually designed to start spinning. So if you just increase that cut-in speed to say six meters per second or six and a half meters per second, so it doesn't start moving and then as it gets windier, the insects are gonna be less likely to be present uh, because it's just too windy, then you're gonna reduce bat mortality. And sure enough, Ed's team found reductions up to 93%, which is highly significant. Uh, so this is, a, this is an, an, an area that, that um, is very promising. However, these recommendations are only voluntary and many companies are just not using them, which is very frustrating. Ed has been doing work on, on ultrasonic devices. Uh, he calls it his Binford 9000 bat begone blaster, that trying to um, basically create this level of high frequency sound that scares them away. They've had some fairly promising results with that, but the cost issues, you have to have two or three of these per turbine, that suddenly when you have, saw the figure a thousand turbines, that's gonna add up um, these are all prototypes. They're not aware that they're yet being manufactured uh, available to the industry. So a lot of things going on. Um, air is a uh, relatively new concept as a habitat. I hadn't really thought about this until fairly recently, but air is certainly a habitat. And that includes uh, air as a habitat that my former agency has and continues to look at because it's, it's very important. And a lot of things use it. There's something migrating year round uh, here in North America, so they're um, through the air, so they're, they're clearly using it. And I would submit that, that the goal of developers in using this airspace should ideally be no harm, do no harm to, to critters. Um, but of course, goals can be frustrating and, and not necessarily met. The challenge, however, is we've got over 900 utility scale wind projects here in the US, just in the continental US alone. Uh, stalled capacity of over 61,300 some megawatts and growing. And um, I'm not sure how many turbines that equates to, maybe 35,000, don't know, but, but still there's a lot of, lot of operating turbines out there. And some of the areas that they wanna put more turbines in are areas, yes, they're very windy, uh, like in the plain states, but also uh, used by a number of species like hooping cranes. For example, we're spending millions of dollars trying to recuperate population of hooping cranes that was on the verge of extinction in the 1930s. So here we're kind of at odds because we've got a rapidly growing industry, exponentially growing um, as far as we can tell. Projections by uh, the end of this decade, as many as 155,000 turbines out there, whatever installed capacity that equates to. Um, and you know perhaps even greater. So um, that's these you know the challenges that are before us. So bird mortality. So looking at this uh, from a temporal and spatial uh, perspective, um, I came up with a calculation in 2009 of 440,000 uh, bird deaths uh, at uh, then operating wind facilities on that year. That uh, got a lot of uh, attention, including by the industry and uh, some members of Congress. Um, Sean Smallwood has republished this, refined his statistic uh, based on 2012 assessments, again, the same he did with the bats, to 573,000 birds being killed per year on average. And he thinks this is still a conservative estimate based on his modeling, of which about at least 83,000 of these are raptors. So birds of prey, uh, particularly uh, eagles, uh, golden eagles and bald eagles, that, that's kind of troubling. And um, Again, Sean's estimate was based on 51,600 some 
megawatts of installed capacity. That's increased by another 10,000. So some of the issues that come into play that affect migratory birds, the growing level of what we call take. Uh, take means injury or death to a protected migratory bird, particularly birds of conservation concern. There are currently 272 species of, we call them BBC, or BCC species that, that are designated um, by the Fish and Wildlife Service. The Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act, the Non-Game Act of 1969 mandates by law that we provide an update of birds of conservation concern every five years. The cumulative impacts to birds uh, affecting their overall populations are clearly of concern. The growing concern that we don't want to create another Altamont Pass wind resource area. Altamont Pass was initially created and developed um, at its peak about 6,500 turbines. If you've ever been to east of Los Angeles or east of San Francisco, you know up there in the Altamont Hills, this is where Altamont Pass facility is located. It continues to kill about 100 golden eagles per year. Uh, and this has gone on for decades. And frustratingly, no uh, uh, criminal liability against the companies involved yet, um, although there have been some suits. So we want to try to avoid that if we can. And then the growing level of take, and I want to define take here for eagles as disturbance, and what we call take resulting in mortality. Uh, they get killed um, uh, of both golden eagles and bald eagles, and particularly golden eagles in the West. They're, they're being impacted very heavily, and that's, that's kind of troubling. So when we look at bird population status, I would just suggest that it's trending downward, unfortunately. Uh, we first published in 1995 uh, uh, called the Non-Game Species of Management Concern List. There were 124 birds designated on that list. 2002, it was renamed the Birds of Conservation Concern, uh, updated and included 131 species. And then in 2008, suddenly it jumped to 147 species, but then went, these were on the national list, but then when you looked at Fish and Wildlife Service regional lists and Birds of Conservation Concern list, it grew to 272 species. And since it's now been five years uh, since this report was published, Fish and Wildlife Service is currently revising that. In fact, when I retired, they were, my colleague Eric Kirshner was in the midst of, of working to get that, uh, get that revised. So it's not good news. And then on top of this, you add federally threatened and endangered species, 77 endangered birds, 15 threatened birds on the endangered species list, and these numbers continue to increase. So that's, that's troubling. And um, one thing we could, we could take home from the birds of Conservation concern list is it's an early warning system. Uh, uh, flags going up when, when species are in decline. And ideally, if we can proactively try to address these declines, then we can keep them off, um, off as candidates on the endangered species loop, which I would submit I think we'd all like to, like to do if we can, we can avoid that scenario. So just recapping here, we've got 1,027 species we manage. These are protected by law. At least 364 or more than 35% of them are in trouble. And then on top of this, about a third of the birds, we just, Fish and Wildlife Service just doesn't really have a good knowledge base and understanding of what's the status of these birds. So um, makes for clearly a management challenge. So let's just touch very quickly on, okay, what happens? Okay, direct effects of wind turbines on birds and bats. So collision mortality, barotrauma, Clearly, the bats to some small birds like hummingbirds have been anecdotally reported. Direct habitat loss modification, barriers are created. Uh, loss of interior forest, grassland habitat can be, can be lost. Fragmentation, increase in edge, uh, increase in nest parasitism and predation, and issues with water quality. So these are direct effects. And then indirect, indirect effects, which arguably may be a little bit more difficult to, to quantify and to document. Things like reduced nesting, breeding density, loss of population vigor, overall population density, habitat and site abandonment, uh, increased isolation between patches, small blocks of habitat, loss of refugia, protected areas for, for birds or bats, attraction to modified habitats that may be suboptimal to what they previously had, behavioral effects such as stress, interruption, modification, and so on, and then disturbance, avoidance, displacement, and just plain unsuitability of habitat. And then lastly, cumulative effects. So what, what's going on here? So when we look at each one of these, here's kind of the real deal. 
So these turbines are getting larger and larger. Uh, rotor swept areas now exceed seven acres in size. So think of your football field, how many acres does that consist of? And then you kind of expand that out. Uh, it's a lot of habitat. They still, at the tips of these blades, even though you see some of these gamongous turbines, you say, God, that's hardly moving at all. Maybe 18 RPMs or something or other at, at full speed, but it's still exceeding 180 miles per hour at blade tip speed. So uh, as you can see, just by the size of these things, that's, a, that's creating huge blade tip vortices, uh, wake, wind wake turbulence, which is gonna affect both birds and bats. In addition, although the turbines are getting larger, the RPM rates are slower, they are getting much taller, much higher into the airspace. The average turbine's going up about 550 feet above ground level in height, but we've got a couple, one um, comp uh, nearing completion down at the end of Chesapeake Bay that's over 750 feet in height. So that's like one and a third the height of the Washington Monument, to put things in perspective. That's up there into the stratosphere, if you will. So um, these taller structures, particularly when the blades are moving, are going to put birds, bats, uh, insects that are migrating, um, and resident species at risk. And, and uh, particularly during inclement weather, when we have migration, songbird migration, uh, ongoing as we speak tonight. Um, once it gets dark, they'll be lifting off and taking off heading south. Then uh, that could put them at risk. And to give you a perspective of how large these things are, so 1980s in Altamont Pass, um, the, the size of the rotor swept area was pretty small, 150 square meters. Now it's over seven acres in size in some of these turbines. So just enormous. Um, and that's, that's the nature of the beast, if you will. Second concern, indirect effects. So habitat fragmentation, disturbance, site avoidance. So any of you have been up to Pennsylvania Turnpike around Myersdale or for that matter, driven up I-81 up to Scranton, you'll see a lot of wind development up there, um, hundreds of turbines. And of course, these facilities are being installed along ridge lines. Well, other species use ridge lines like um, peregrine falcons and golden eagles as they migrate south or, or north. Um, bats clearly use these forested areas. And so it's opening up habitats, uh, fragmenting habitats and, and creating problems. And, and so, you know, we have to look at, okay, is it indirect effects uh, concerned here in the east with eagles? We have a small population of golden eagles that nests up in Canada and then overwinters down here in West Virginia and southern, southwestern Virginia. Um, concern about oh, what are these things going to do, like along the Kittatinny Ridge coming through Pennsylvania as they're migrating down and we see these turbines going up. Or if you're out in the Midwest, prairie grouse or the North Pacific Northwest area, um, sage grouse and so on, um, um, these these indirect effects can have uh, um, um, real create real challenges for, for these uh, suites of species of birds and, and bats as well. Third concern, cumulative effects, cumulative impacts. So what are the significance of these impacts? Uh, National Environmental Policy Act goes into great detail, NEPA review on cumulative effects and how you are supposed to assess the effects of all impacts to bird populations, cumulatively with all wind projects, overall effects of habitat loss, displacement, barrier effects, collision mortality. What are the cumulative effects of all anthropocentric structures, all the things that we do as humans, our footprint on, on birds over the lifetime of these structures? And then of course, with climate change, how is this affecting species? And then lastly, are these effects additive to natural, normal, compensatory mortality? So we have to look at you know, communication towers and wires and so on and, and all these other things. So it, uh, it's a lot of, lot of work. Very quickly, just run you through the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, how many of you have never heard about MBTA? Okay, so um, James, it's a, it's a federal statute. It implements four bilateral protocols. And um, it was, these protocols were again with Canada, Mexico, Canada in 1916, Mexico in 1932, Japan 72 and Russia 78 um, that protect our shared migratory bird resources between us and the countries which they're migrating to and from. So it currently again protects 1,027 species. It also protects the eggs, the feathers, the parts, and the nests of birds. So you cannot take, you cannot possess a nest of an actively 
being used nest of a migratory bird, um, during the nesting season, you can now possess it. Um, you can't keep it, but you can at least possess it temporarily, um, uh, legally, uh, out of the breeding season. Eagle nests are protected year-round, both for bald and golden eagles. So uh, we have permits for possessing things um, for um, special purpose, all sorts of uses. Don't need to get into that tonight, but, but Fish and Wildlife Service has a whole permitting regime of, of many dozens of different types of permits. Species that are not protected, uh, um, that are non-migratory, include the rough grouse, the wild turkey, and then invasives, exotics like the European starling, the English sparrow, the monk parakeet, the Asian pheasant are not protected by the statute. And Congress, I mentioned strict liability, Congress intended, intended when they wrote the report language for, for the statute that the take of even one migratory bird was a criminal violation of the statute. So having been involved in all three of the cases I'll mention here when I worked for Fish and Wildlife Service, um, there have been some pr criminal prosecution. The first I was involved with was Moon Lake Electric Cooperative. This was an electrocution issue in Western Colorado. They were fined $100,000 and um, the company executives were put on probation for three or four years. Pacificor, more recently in um, 2009, was fined $10.5 million for criminal liability, electrocuting um, eagles and other birds of prey. And then most recently, Duke Energy was fined a million dollars for uh, um, um, blade take of migratory birds at their wind facilities in Wyoming. So, and in all cases, again, the executives uh, have been put on probation. So it's kind of a wake up call. Not seen much prosecution. Duke Energy is the first criminal liability case that, that has been floated by uh, Fish and Wildlife Service and, and actually implemented by Justice Department and, and, and run through and, and uh, ultimately settled by Duke Energy. Um, but um, there's been a call for, for more action here. Uh, if you're familiar with, with Endangered Species Act at all, Migratory Bird Pre Treaty Act has no consultation provision or process like we see in ESA. So you have Section 7 um, um, in ESA for federal agencies where consultation occurs. We don't have that with, with MBTA uh, for what's called incidental or accidental take. Um, dealing with the public, you have Section 10 as well, Habitat Conservation Plans. So um, the message here is that to minimize or avoid take, the developer, whether it's a wind or solar developer, should be working with Fish and Wildlife Service to avoid or minimize take from, from their projects from the get-go. And uh, sounds good on paper, um, but there, there have been some issues. Um, the action agency, again, the Fish and Wildlife Service, should be consulted early and often before a company, in the case of wind, um, uh, negotiates a, uh, and signs a landowner agreement, negotiates a power purchase agreement, and for that matter, acquires a bank loan for this facility, they, need to, they should be talking with Fish and Wildlife Service. Some companies have been responsible and, and done that, yes. Others have not. Uh, companies need to take all necessary, appropriate, and practicable steps to avoid or minimize take of protected migratory birds, most especially birds of conservation concern, because uh, these are species that are in decline and, and potentially in trouble. But there's a rub here. Um, these interactions are just, for the most part, not taking place. They're not happening. The industry claims that its data are proprietary. Some of the consultants tend to slant their outcomes heavily in favor of the industry. No surprise, but that, that is an issue. And I would submit that these kind of activities do a disservice to the industry. They clearly further impact birds and bats. They create new problems which otherwise, in my opinion, could be avoided and they fail to adequately address our carbon footprint overall because we're spending more time doing um, battles with, with the renewable industry rather than dealing with the problem, um, which isn't going to solve anything. So Fish and Wildlife Service got engaged in this issue. Secretary Norton in 2002, um, under the Bush administration, developed a renewable energy on public lands initiative. Um, she said, I want Fish and Wildlife Service to develop wind energy guidelines. So. I got tasked to chair the committee, um, and we created the voluntary interim guidelines to avoid or minimize impacts from land-based wind turbines. Uh, actually did it in less than a year, which is truly amazing if any of you know how feds operate and the, the federal process goes. It takes a long time, but, but we did, and uh, uh, it was open to two years of public review and comment by the industry and interested stakeholders. 
Um, anyway, after the, or let's just say that ideally here, the, the premise of these guidelines, and they were voluntary, was to have um, consultants and the companies they represented come to the Fish and Wildlife Service, particularly our field offices, uh, to take steps to avoid uh, take of migratory birds under uh, Migratory Bird Treaty Act, Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, and the Endangered Species Act. And this was to be done by properly evaluating sites where they were thinking about developing wind, uh, properly locating and designing turbines and the associated infrastructure that goes with them, and then doing pre- and post-construction research and monitoring to identify and assess risk and the potential impacts to wildlife. And again, it was voluntary, um, and uh, it, it was our first and uh, initial best effort at, at dealing with the industry. Um, there was clearly some quite a bit of blowback in the comments. Uh, um, the conservation community wanted our, when we updated our guidelines to be regulatory, the industry thought that what we'd already put together was too onerous. So, you know, how do you deal with these issues? It's a bit of a conundrum. So, make a long story short, we went through a whole process. We were going to have a collaborative review, and we were threatened with a lawsuit under the Federal Advisory Committee Act, FACA. So we created a FAC committee. And in 2008, that committee, Wind Energy Guidelines Federal Advisory Committee, convened. I was one of the two technical advisors to the committee representing my agency at the time. And uh, the committee uh, released its initial recommendations to the Secretary of Interior in March of 2010. So Fish and Wildlife Service took these recommendations. We convened a working group of about 25 of us, uh, consisting of a whole host of biologists, land managers, law enforcement, refuge personnel, contaminant specialists, and so on. And we met for over six months. I was designated as one of the chairs of the two subcommittees. And um, we created a draft land-based wind energy guidelines from Fish and Wildlife Service that were released in 2011. Uh, for 90 days public comment. Um, at any rate, um, the guidelines, the framework that had been initially developed by the Federal Advisory Committee, and then we put some, some meat on the bone, included a tiered process, which was very good. Uh, we had tier one landscape assessment, tier two actual site assessment, tier three pre-construction monitoring, tier four post-construction monitoring assessment, and tier five uh, research efforts. Uh, in theory, a really good framework. Um, the problem was that all of us on the team that created the guidelines, um, we wanted to see that, that during the revamping process that there was accountability, the final guidance was much more prescriptive than what the FAC had provided. So we did just that. And not surprisingly, the, when, the, when our recommendations went back to the FAC committee, they were mostly scuttled. And what, what ended up as final guidance was what was essentially initially created. Uh, what the FAC, what was essentially sent on to the Interior Secretary and approved by the administration was their initial version. It was voluntary. It lacked prescriptive issues that we really wanted to see in there. Uh, it contained no mandates for regulation, and it was a little accountability that, that we saw there. And so whether you're doing your due diligence, due diligence or not, hard to say based on the, the current guidelines. So what we have now is a lot of confusion. Um, Again, the monitoring and mortality data that are being collected by the consultants on behalf of the industry remains confidential. They feel it's proprietary, even though the industry is getting, what is it, $23 per megawatt hour production tax credit from the federal government. So one would think that that would put it into the federal arena, that that information would be available to the, to the public through FOIA or whatever. Um, but it's not. And... Uh, the data have not been shared for the most part with the service biologists. We've seen a number of lawsuits have been filed. And there's some perception by some folks that, that this is a greenwash. So it's not really helping the industry's image um, by the direction that things are headed. Um, I want to submit, however, that there are some companies um, that have worked very responsibly, worked with a service, really done their due diligence, and Ted Williams, uh, in his um, little uh, article in Audubon's uh, spring edition this year called A Mighty Wind, acknowledges, starts out his article by talking about a, a developer that is very responsible. But he says that wildlife smart wind power may be as close as it gets to green energy. But over vast swaths of America, the smart part is still more hot air than reality. 
especially when it comes to Raptors. And this is, this is frustrating. I, I, I agree with Ted. In fact, I was interviewed for his article, so although you didn't hear me say that because when I was <laughs> a Fed, I wasn't supposed to talk to, uh, to reporters or whatever, but that's another story. Um, so the problem is that we've got bald and golden eagles protected by the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act um, that, that um, bald eagles delisted. We, we developed in 2009. In fact, my colleagues, uh, Eliza Savage uh, and Diana Whittington, Eliza wrote the, the eagle rule and Diana did the NEPA analysis on it, the environmental assessment. Um, we came up with an eagle rule because of the delisting of the bald eagle in 2007 to try to address these issues. And we also developed guidance, the Eagle Conservation Plan guidance. Um, version two for wind creates a really good overall framework for, for addressing um, the assessment of risk at potential wind development sites around the country. That's a, that's a very good thing. Um, sadly, however, politics has kind of come into play. Surprise, surprise. And uh, the ECPG is also voluntary. So it's been a little bit of an issue. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have facilities like Altamont that are continuing to kill eagles. They've been through a three-year uh, litigation process where the court said you need to reduce eagle mortality at least 50%, uh, and they haven't been able to do that, even with seasonal shutdowns. So we have a continuing problem. And that, that in my mind, is, is very troubling. And then we're seeing these huge projects like in Wyoming that are, that are about to be approved or already up and running that are killing particularly uh, both bald eagles and golden eagles. So at um, any rate, we've got um, another issue that we've been, our Fish and Wildlife Service has been um, received a um, 60 day notice of intent uh, under lawsuit provision. Um, we kind of, against the advice of, of a number of us in, in Fish and Wildlife Service and Interior, not to go this route, they did anyway. And um, this is basically giving the wind energy a 30-year permit to kill bald and golden eagles when all other industries don't have that option. And that the previous permit or the existing permit right now is, is five years at maximum. So not surprising, well, again, we've seen lawsuits on this one. And, and uh, so um, um, Fish and Wildlife Service has been conducting scoping meetings to rewrite the 2009 rule and look at this new permit and it's, Sadly, it's a lot of taxpayers' money uh, being spent that might have been spent better, but that's just my opinion. So I also want to point out that these issues are incredibly complex, uh, very complicated. I'm just sort of scraping the proverbial tip of the iceberg on these things. Um, and um, we need to base the actions that we take from now on on sound science, peer-reviewed scientific findings, management decisions that are based on these issues, um, whether it's for eagles or migratory birds or bats or their habitats, um, so that we can we can bring things into line and start doing things um, appropriately. And there's a lot of mistrust, uh, a lot of discord amongst the environmental community on these issues, and it's frankly not surprising. Um, so fixing the problems. Unlike some of the other issues that I worked on, like transmission and distribution wires, where we have uh, best practices, the APLIC, Avian Powerline Interaction Committee, suggested practices that are very thick documents, and I'm familiar with them because I co-authored um, uh, several of them. Um, these have lots of tools in the chest of options. Communication towers, we, we've discovered that the steady burning red lights, if you eliminate them, that can reduce mortality at communication towers by at least 50%, maybe closer to 70%. So we got things to fix those, but we don't have a lot of tools in the chest of options to deal with, with wind energy. The biggest one is location. It's like real estate, location, 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 three most important things. Well, same thing here, it's location. So you've got to properly site, assess the risk of a, of a proposed site for development, and then do your due diligence in that risk assessment, and then follow up um, post-construction and do monitoring to see if you were on as far as your modeling for your risk was concerned uh, before you construct it. That, sadly, is not happening for the most part. Um, the whole issue of cut-in speed, again, that finding is astronomical that Arnett and his team found, but but it's voluntary. So we got a lot of companies, well, yeah, I, we could do that, but we're not going to. And that's, that's really not helping the issue. So we're seeing, um, you know, an order of almost 
order of magnitude more bats, close to a million bats now, um, being killed per year at wind facilities. Feathering, um, this means you basically change the pitch of the blade so that it stops moving, but these blades may take a couple of minutes to slow down and stop moving. This is a SCADA system that's being used by several facilities in the Texas area along the Gulf Coast. Uh, it's a radar uh, computerized system that when, it, when the radar picks up a certain number of targets, um, it automatically shuts the whole system down. But again, it takes some time. And the, the jury is out on the efficacy of, of um, this technique. It's shown promise, but we, we need to look at it in more detail. Uh, mortality data are not being shared with Fish and Wildlife Service. So again, since we don't know what they're doing, um, other than some of the bigger picture issues, we don't know how effectively it is based on what they're finding at carcass counts. Uh, it's unclear if their mitigation measures are working or, or not. Uh, vertical helix turbines, and I've got a little one down here in the bottom of the slide. Um, this might be a really neat alternative. Um, they're more expensive, clearly much smaller than, than uh, um, your you know, five, six, seven hundred foot turbines but they are much more efficient and uh, we could put these in a number of areas uh, and um, generate electricity uh, and not kill the birds and bats and fragment the habitats uh, like we're, we're doing now with, with the industrial facilities. But the, the direction, the economics of scale seems to be the driver here. Higher, better uh, wind is a, it's the, um, it's a um, function of the cube of airspeed. So if you get it up there where the airspeed is consistently blowing, get it up higher, uh, you're going to generate more electricity. Well, as you see, there's some consequences for that. So, um, and of course, the, the bigger these facilities, the, the greater the impact on, on habitat. Um, I would submit the need, and I've had a number of my colleagues, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, mention this, the need for independent third-party monitoring of both wind facilities and, and solar facilities. Uh, we're getting, our law enforcement agents are getting reports of data falsification, fraudulent reporting, inadequate monitoring. Um, there are also concerns about the vested interests that consultants have. Are they truly representing um, the, the resource or are they representing the industry in which they're working for, spotty reporting, proprietary data, and again, the unwillingness to work with Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, unlike we're seeing with a number of the companies in the electric utility industry. So I, I would say time is right to ho however change this thing. As Ted Williams again uh, reminds us, some wildlife mortality is inevitable with, uh, with even the best projects, but nothing will do harm to the industry, uh, um, do more harm to the industry than excusing or tolerating wildlife stupid projects that give it a bad name. And by some of the direction that's headed, that's, that's not helping the things. And, if you're concerned about this, here's an opportunity to have your voice heard, you know, whether it's, it's writing your members of Congress or, or Fish and Wildlife Service or Department of Energy or, or uh, whomever. Let's transition quickly, uh, time remaining, to the other issue, and that's industrial solar facilities. Um, these are just beginning to really crop up in Southern California, the Mojave Desert, and I'm looking at three here. Ivanpah, this is a uh, power tower facility. These these facilities are enormous. They have over 300,000 mirrors per area. And then they have this tower that's 500 and about 500 or 460 feet in height. And these mirrors about the size of a garage door. So you got something like 300,000 beaming light at the power tower and creating temperatures in excess of 800 degrees or thereabouts. So um, this is public so I can mention this and I'm no longer fit anyway. But um, our law enforcement agents were out doing a site visit at Ivanpah, and they weren't there a half an hour, and a peregrine falcon came flying by and went right through the power tower and <laughs> incinerated. So not good. Um, so they're all going, oh, my God, what do we do? So these are, these are real-time issues. Uh, Genesis is a trough system. So you've got troughs here, and then there's a heater pipe in it, and the uh, light beams are being concentrated on the heater pipe. Uh, there are issues of blunt force trauma. And then desert sunlight is a photovoltaic system, probably certainly more passive, but um, the, the shiny surfaces can be mistaken by a number of birds. Uh, horned grebe's a big concern um, where they think it's water and they crash into it or whatever and, and uh, maybe injured or die. So um, these three systems again, um, photovoltaics, um, 
basically there was an opportunistic and I say opportunistic um, just some people went around for a couple days and picked up carcasses so no design protocol no no monitoring system put in place just picking up carcasses at at the uh, Desert Sunlight Facility, they found 61 buried carcasses. They were uh, uh, transferred to the National Fish and Wildlife Forensics Lab, uh, and uh, the lab did uh, necropsy analysis on them to determine what happened, and blunt trauma, um, predation, and unknown causes seemed to be the, the biggest issues that, that affected the birds. Trough systems, again, these parabolic mirrors. Uh, Genesis Solar is an example. 31 bird carcasses were seen here. They were sent to the forensics lab, and Again, impact trauma, predation, and unknown were the causes here. So um, some issues. And then with the solar power towers, Ivanpah is the only one that's up and operating. It's not fully functional yet, but um, it will be soon. And this is the most complex and, unfortunately, the most deadly of these, these uh, industrial solar facilities. It's killing birds and bats at, at uh, high numbers. Um, it's getting up to 300,000 mirrors here. These are the size of garage doors. They produce this intense beam of, or beams of light onto the power tower, heating uh, um, uh, water producing steam at up to temperatures of 800 degrees Fahrenheit right now, perhaps even higher when they're all up and running. Uh, you have a, a turbine that, that uh, is generating electricity and then a, an air cool condenser system. Uh, it's been classified by the forensics lab as a mega trap for wildlife. In addition to being a significant uh, impactor on bats and monarch butterflies, and I think we all realize that monarch butterflies are in trouble as well. Um, it's, uh, it's attracting insects, which in turn are attracting insect-eating birds, which are being incapacitated by this heater beater, solar flux, whatever you want to call it, um, that uh, attracts in turn predators, which feed on the carcasses. So you have an entire food chain uh, vulnerable to injury and death that's been um, created as a result of, of this facility. Here at Idavapaw, on these opportunistic surveys of a few days, they collected 141 birds that, not surprisingly, 47 died from solar flux, 24 from impact trauma, 5 from predation, 14 undetermined trauma, and then 46 unknown. So if these three commercial energy facilities are killing just from opportunistic surveys, 233 birds were collected just over a few days in 2013. Then it begs the question, what are they doing to birds, bats, and insects over the year? And one estimate that just came out is perhaps right now based on just on the operating um, solar, industrial solar facilities, 28,000 birds, including golden eagles, rapidly declining populations of western greaves, peregrine falcons, burrowing owls, short-eared owls, and a whole host of other birds are being killed um, at these arrays only in Southern California. So this doesn't bode well for the solar uh, industry and, and uh, solar energy development. And, and so maybe at least from this industrial side, we need to rethink this. Um, I would suggest it's time to go back to the basics. Sound science should be the driver here since uh, these facilities are mostly on Bureau of Land Management lands, that, that uh, they need to be held accountable for pre-construction monitoring and NEPA review. I would submit that I don't think, from what I've seen, that their NEPA review is all that good. And uh, they need to take steps with the operating facilities to reduce bird mortality uh, and bat mortality immediately. Fencing, nets, perch deterrence, exclusionary measures, UV reflective glass so that birds can see these things, recognize them. Uh, su suspending the operations of the power towers when birds are flying through there or when bats are active, if they might still be operating, these kind of things. And they need to really have some accountability. At least two years post-construction mortality monitoring done every day is the recommendation. So um, if these things don't take place, it just it's not going to help the industry. So in conclusion, these issues clearly provide huge challenges. And... and um, particularly since we know so little about the impacts of commercial wind development on trust resources and their habitats, whether it's bird species protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act or Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act or the Endangered Species Act. And unfortunately, we know even less about the impacts of commercial solar energy on trust species and their habitats. So I would suggest this calls for a complete paradigm shift. Um, in assessing sites, adequate protecting risk pre-construction, validating risk post-construction, uh, and reversing these ongoing uh, troubling trends. 
if renewables are to succeed, we need to make these changes. Um, it also suggests a uh, shift in agency attitudes about protecting their cultures as opposed to protecting the wildlife which they're entrusted to conserve and manage. Interior Department's one that comes to mind. Um, clearly, we have Interior has trust responsibilities there. Energy Department, uh, another, uh, arguably, since they're signatories to the Migratory Bird Executive uh, Order. And um, I would submit, on the other hand, that where companies are working with Fish and Wildlife Service, really trying to do their due diligence to make a difference, do things right, um, they need to be patted on the back and applauded. And that, that in my mind, is a really good thing. So we, as, as Williams does with his article, he starts out accentuating the positive. Here's a, here's a company that's really doing its due diligence. It's sticking wind facilities in Aroostook County in northern Maine in a degraded blueberry habitat that not much in the line of birds and bats. Hey, that's the way to go. Um, but then he gets into discussion about other companies that aren't doing such a good job. So I would say in summary, we should favor conservation of wildlife that's in the public trust. So it's all wildlife belongs to us. Let's, let's conserve it. Uh, we should be developing renewable energy that's bird, bat, and habitat friendly. And we should be using informed uh, decisions based on adequate environmental assessment and sound science.